This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 113. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And welcome back, Free Heal Lifers. It's always great to be here on Monday mornings and get the week started right, talking about the best turn on snow, the Telemark turn. So to hop right into it, we got some newsroom and notes, some upcoming events, and uh, then we'll get into another sweet podcast and uh thanks for being here and listening being part of our free hill life family we all appreciate it so probably the biggest no, uh biggest news in terms of the shop is we finally have all the 22 designs bindings back in stock so be sure to get on that it's been a little tricky to get a hold of some of those uh outlaw x's and other 22 designs bindings this season and we've got them so get at it while you can while supplies last and we're already cresting over into february here pretty soon so pretty wild times a ticking uh, we've got all the demos mounted up and you can rent those and take them out they're ready to roll out the door you can try some of the latest ntn equipment and we are happy to help dial you in there and uh, that was fun. I was out skiing yesterday and actually uh, met uh, a customer on the hill. And it was cool because I just kind of went up and uh, <laughs> she was actually looking at my retro skis. <laughs> it's like nice telly skis. She's like, I just got back into it. And uh, she ended up uh, being someone who, uh, a customer who had rented from us and was trying out some volet skis, some women's man ties, I believe, and uh, some outlaw X's. And she hadn't been in, in Telemark for like 15 years. So she was getting back into it. So that was really cool. Always fun to see uh, folks out on the slopes and appreciate the support. So yeah, if you're looking to demo, you're in Salt Lake, hit us up. Our friends over at uh, Telemark Colorado talked about this last week. The kings and queens of the heel Telemark video competition is live. Uh, this is an awesome competition they put together where... They have a rule book or, or uh, a booklet with a bunch of challenges that you can do and uh, create your own video edit. So head over to telemarkcolorado.com to check that out. Download the booklet and go uh, participate. For everyone uh, last week uh, in Michigan... Big thanks to all those that came out and supported the demo at Pine Knob Ski and Snowboard, Res Snowboard Resort in conjunction with Motor City Telly and Free Hill Life Midwest. It was awesome seeing everyone that showed up for that. We really appreciate it. Psyched to be uh, out in the Midwest with uh, our buddy Keith Opperman. His son Gavin was there and uh, Kurt and all the crew at Motor City Telly. Much appreciated for having us hosting the FHL crew uh, for that demo. And hopefully all of you got to try Telemark that we're in that area. It's exciting to see Telemark grow everywhere. And we're always pumped to be a part of it wherever we can. So kind of uh, flowing into the upcoming events and sticking with the Midwest. Guess what's coming up? February 11th through the 13th, Midwest Telefest at Porcupine Mountain Ski Area in the UP of Michigan. I've been there myself a few years back. I have a tattoo from going to that thing that shows my love of the Midwest Telefest. And uh, it, it's a wonderful place. It's a beautiful area right on uh, the edge of the lake up there. And uh, tons of amazing telemark skiers coming from all over the Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And there's a lot of love and a lot of history. One of the longest running telemark festivals in the country. So be sure to check that out. That same weekend in Colorado, Tele Festivus at Monarch is happening. So believe it was Steven that sent me that information. So thank you very much for uh, reminding me about Telefestivus. Always psyched to get uh, 
get new notices on events that may or may not be on my radar. I know there's more of you out there. So if you listen to the podcast, just literally take two seconds, send me a one-liner. This is happening. <laughs> Location, date, time. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get the good word out. Uh, then a couple that I brought up in uh, past episodes. 36th annual Corey Anderson Telemark Festival in Vermont, February 26th through the 27th. Go get some, you New Englanders. And uh, awesome to see that still going. Saturday, March 5th, the most important day of the entire year. World Telemark Day. Mark your calendars. You can celebrate this anywhere that there is the ability to put on your Telemark skis. I, I was going to say snow, but I guess if there's grass, I mean, whatever. Just go out. You're going to hashtag World Telemark Day if you're on a social media platform. Hashtag Spread Telemark. We're all going to celebrate together worldwide. And we are going to show how alive and well Telemark is. It's always the first Saturday in March. So if you want to put that on your calendar right now, first Saturday in March on repeat, it will go on forever and ever and ever. This is the eighth annual. And uh, me and the Free Hill Life team, we're going to be up at Alta shredding some laps. So if you're in the zone, Colorado, Idaho, uh, Utah, California, Nevada, you want to come hang out with us? Come to come to Utah. It's a it's a, a loose gathering of all of us, and we're just going to get together and hang out. Saturday, March fifth. Don't forget World Telemark Day. And then following up, March eleventh and twelfth at Mad River Glen in Vermont, you're going to have the Free Heel Frolic. Put that on your calendar, and uh, that'll be wrapping up. I think the season of events over on the right coast of the United States, as I like to say. Tons of good stuff. Great to see a ton of events happening this year. Thank you all to all of you organizers that put these things together. Organize, get locals to help out, put demos together, share your equipment. This is how we grow telemark skiing everywhere in the world. Everyone's just putting in uh, an amazing effort to share the turn, protect the turn and pass it on to the next generation or pass it on to the same generation, but just someone who's interested. So thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. All of us at free Hill life appreciate it. And we hope that you'll continue to do so. Or if you're even thinking about doing something in your area, hopefully all these people that have put time and effort into doing it into their local areas, Maybe it inspires you to do the same. So hopping into today's episode. My guest today is the all around powerhouse behind the unbreakable body and fit for real life. The only thing Kate has ever cared about is helping people build their body to be strong, capable, and unbreakable so they can live life as fully, deeply, and energetically as possible. Kate earned a BS in exercise science from uh, Valparaiso University and went on to study a variety of certifications and trainings, all of which helped her curate the holistic approach she takes to body care today. In addition to her work with clients in person and on her websites, she's coached at Nerd Fitness Adult Summer Camp, has been featured in Experience Life Magazine, Livestrong.com, and a variety of other publications. She lives in the great state of Utah, where she can put her unbreakable body to use for adventures in the mountains. So please welcome to the podcast, Kate Galliette. All right, Kate, welcome back to the Free Hill Life podcast. How's it going? It's great to be here again. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's been a, a little while since we did the last episode where we sort of... Uh, got to know you and what you do um and uh wanted to have you back on because your new book just came out today and uh you can get that so we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh but first i wanted to kind of go back and since we last talked like in that 
if you haven't checked out uh, the previous episode, definitely go back and and uh, you can listen to what Kate's uh, philosophy is all about and talking about uh, the unbreakable body and uh, all sorts of fitness stuff. But we talked a little bit about your your ski adventures last time, getting into Telemark and following our first interview, you actually had a small group of people that you got together uh, that you signed up uh, all all they were all telemark skiers i think mostly mostly yeah but i just kind of want and they kind of went through one of your uh one of your training programs and i thought maybe that'd be a good place for us to start oh that would be fantastic um yep so the last time we met i was talking about how important things like the six pillars of an unbreakable body are for ski fitness and i was halfway joking when i said like your ski fitness program really shouldn't be all about like eight million lunges I'm only mildly joking. You're going to do some lunges if you need to be fit for the mountains, but um, why we shouldn't just be doing um, an extraordinary amount of like one thing to get ready for the the slopes. And so I took a group of folks through uh, eight weeks of eight and 12 weeks. I had one that went a little bit longer because her ski trip was a little bit later in the in the start of the season. Um, and we went through and trained to be ready for the slopes and build a foundation and a strong base and um, build their six pillars so that they are resilient on the slopes and built our fitness so that we were able to feel confident as we head into the season. And it went great. They were fantastic, great students. They really, <clears throat> some of the highlights were they really enjoyed um, learning how to strengthen their body in ways beyond just this traditional sense where you're doing squats and lunges. For instance, <clears throat> excuse me, when we do squats and lunges, we're in this mid range of the length and tension of our muscles. And so you're moving through ranges of motion that are kind of big and expansive, and that's really good. Um, but the end ranges of our length and our tension of our muscles often don't get trained. And that's a big miss in most fitness programs. Um, and that's something that we can easily rectify by including it in our strength training and in our mobility work. And so I was teaching them how to do things that actually challenge their ability to be strong at these end ranges. And so you might think, well, what's an end range? Well, when you're skiing, you're gonna have to move your ankles into an amount of flexion, you're gonna have to move your knees and your hips into an amount of flexion, you're gonna have to extend up out of those completely. And so if you think of like the knee joint, if you think of when a knee is fully bent, like if you were pulling your uh, heel up to your butt, your knee's fully bent, that's more like an end range. And all of the muscles that are around that have to be strong. Otherwise, you aren't going to be very capable in that position. And then if you think of a knee again for the other end range, it's when the knee is fully extended. And most people just gloss over those areas and don't give them much thought. The problem is that if you don't train that, not only are you more susceptible to injury as you move towards your end ranges of your muscles length and ability to be tense, you also aren't as strong as you could be. And so my athletes that I worked with got a lot stronger in part because we were doing mid-range strength exercises that are familiar to lots of folks like step-ups and um, leg curls and things like that. But also we were strengthening those end ranges, which in turn makes you stronger throughout the span of how you're going to move. So not only did it become stronger in general and stronger for the slopes, but they also became stronger across the board of what they were going to have to manage. So there's fewer positions they couldn't manage. There's more strength overall. And the benefit of working these end ranges along with the mid ranges was such that they then are more resilient when they're out there. So less likely to get injured, more likely to bounce back quickly when they do. So it was really fun to introduce that to some folks because I think that's still new in a lot of ski fitness. Well, in general, I think learning to train your entire range of tissue tension and tolerance is pretty new for a lot of people. So it was really neat to share that with them. And then to also share some frameworks around training that folks don't think about. For instance, when we talked about the pillars last time and we talked about strong feet and people are like, oh, well, why would you think about that? Because they're in ski boots, you know, even even our boots, which are way more movable than AT boots. Not that I can remember wearing AT boots very much. I went skiing once when I was in eighth grade, you know, so it was like, I can barely remember that. But walking in the Telemark boots 
is stiff enough for me for someone who's used to like freedom of motion but i can only imagine how much worse that is in an at at boot anyways people are in boots so they're like oh i don't think about my ankles and my legs and my feet and whatever um but when you do you have more sense within your boot and so you're able to navigate your turn a lot better and experience more of the turn really because your brain actually is getting more information because your feet are stronger and sensing more and thus also helping you control your turn a whole lot more too. So it was really neat to share all that stuff and and much more, but yeah, those are my favorite highlights. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And and it's it's always interesting to, to talk to you about skiing because you know, when, when you talk about like end ranges of motion and stuff like that, I think about, even the way you're describing it, I don't, when I think about fitness and skiing, which, and I probably alluded to that in the first episode <laughs> or, or when I first met you that, uh, I probably didn't think about fitness in turn. You, like I just, I went out and did it. I just, I skied to get, I guess, f- ski fit. And the more I skied, the more fit I felt, which I guess is one way to get there, right? Like, you know, uh, you're obviously, uh, going through all these motions, but I think about how that, <clears throat> how important that would be from, uh, like when you talk about the end ranges, like I went skiing yesterday and I'm definitely feeling it today <laughs> as we're recording this. And I, and that makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, strenuous motions and stuff that, um, probably had, a, had I maybe trained a little bit more, uh, maybe would just make my sh- the strength in all these uh dynamic movements you're making on the mountain more effective hopefully i'm understanding that right no that's you- it's a great point like you have to meld the two together and a good coach will do that with you and teach you how to do that yourself because you know michael jordan couldn't become michael jordan if he only was in the gym lifting weights and practicing technique drills on the court he had to play he had to play a lot to be get to get that good um, but he wouldn't have been that good either. In fact, if folks watched that documentary that we watched, um, the last dance that was on Netflix or somewhere, um, or ESPN, he talks about that. And one of the years when like things were kind of starting to fall off and they didn't do as well. And he, that off season, the next day after the, the final tournament that they were in ended, he was in the gym and he planned to put on tons of muscle and get way fitter and really put his efforts into training his body to be better on the court. Um, and what a difference that made because then I think they had their next three run championship run there after that. Um, but that's that melding of the two is really important. And I think some people get stuck spending all their time in the gym and training for the thing. And some people spend all their time doing the thing and could probably benefit from training more. And the perfect meld of the two is when you really think about your entire year as like an opportunity to build something for yourself, whether it's to get ready for ski fitness or it's to hit, fix your injuries in an off season. Um, but that's, I should back up there. Like when you think about your year, I think a lot of people for whatever reason, just think it's a good idea to get fit for skiing, for example, but just don't get around to it until it's really close to when the season starts. But if you, the philosophy I take on life and you know this, cause you're around me all the time is that every day is an opportunity to build something and your body is building or not building every day based on what you do. And so just thinking about a 12 week training program or, you know, it's, you know, a month before the ski season. So I'm going to get out and hike around. That's part of it, but you're leaving opportunity on the table. If you aren't looking at your entire life as an opportunity to build now, I don't say that saying like, oh, because we're all going to try to be like Michael Jordan and literally eat, sleep and breathe whatever sport we're training for. It doesn't have to be like that. It's so doable within your daily life to incorporate signals that create responses that the net of which becomes you stay resilient once you become resilient. You get stronger regularly. You maintain the hiccups in life when you can't hit the gym because work was crazy or um, you know, they're like the problem in Utah, there are no parking passes available. So you don't get to go ski this week and you need to do something different. Um, building your life so that it can actually be a, a source of building for you is like, what a great way to live in my opinion. Yeah, no, you bring up a good point and that's, and I, I thought, <clears throat> I actually thought about that when I was skiing yesterday, cause I think is, uh, you know, when, when you're younger, 
you know, or at least when I, when I was younger, I guess, you know, and you know, when you're in your teens and twenties, like you literally just ski all the time. And I think the way I looked at fitness was kind of what I was saying. Like I would, I was fit because I was hiking or I was skiing every day or whatever was going on, you know? And I think as a nor, uh, as you get older or you have a more quote unquote normal life, you know, it becomes much more important to, in order to enjoy skiing when you do have the opportunity, whether you're somebody who goes on ski vacations for 10 days, or maybe you're a weekend warrior and you're skiing, you know, Saturdays and Sundays with the family. Um, I think that is something being around you. I I've really learned. And I think actually really benefits me on a daily basis where I, you know, it, the, I had kind of the joke I was texting, uh, uh, Telly Tay yesterday when I was up skiing and, you know, and, uh, you know, I was definitely saying, you know, you know, I'm feeling it, you know, I'm feeling it a little bit because of the gear I was skiing. I was skiing on some vintage gear and, you know, the joke's always like, oh, Madsen just gets off the couch and goes skiing. But in a way, like, I, I never feel like I'm getting off the couch in that sense where I literally am never doing anything and then I'm going skiing. And I think just having that daily, I think that really is, you know, kind of what we're going to get talking about. And I just finished your book, which is amazing. Thank and, you. And and it really, I think that's the coolest part about it is it's it's great for every, I think every age group, but I think especially, you know, like, you know, we're in our forties, the daily, what you do on the daily definitely not only improves life in general, but I think it really improves when you do go out and do the things that you enjoy. You might not be a high level athlete like Michael Jordan, where you have every day to go train and get ready for that one experience. But it's, you know, I can say from my own personal experience, like yesterday going skiing, I, it's more enjoyable to me because I'm not technically quote unquote coming off the couch. Like I actually have a daily routine, you know, yeah. we, we get out and even just walk around the block. Like mm -hmm. I feel like my, you know, my tissues aren't in muscles, like aren't just going from zero to 60, right. you know? And I, I think yeah. that's really important. Well, and you touched on something important there. There's a, a really, oof, a great study that just came out. That's going to disappoint a lot of people. Um, and we, we're starting to put the nail in the coffin now on this notion that your metabolism slows down as you age. It doesn't. Really? Yeah. You just stop being active. They did this incredible, super landmark study showing that what changes is that our activity level drops as we age. And so naturally, you're, if you continue to eat the same amount of food you normally eat, but your activity level goes down and you lose muscle mass, of course you're going to gain weight because that's how weight gain weight weight gain happens along with hormonal changes and things like that but the the overwhelming result from this study was that your metabolism is pretty darn similar to what it was when you're 20 you just stop doing a lot of stuff and people say that like oh well when you're a kid you can get away with anything you can because you're active all the time you don't have a lot of constraints on your life and so you're moving freely you Hopefully kids are still having free play in addition to sports and kind of structured play. Um, I know in some places folks are losing that, but um, you have a lot of activity that's happening when you're younger and you're more carefree in your house. So like you sit on the floor, you run around, you do silly things like seeing if you can load the dishwasher with one hand only. Like you, you're a kid, you, you just look at the world differently. As an adult, you start to lose a lot of that. And so... For everyone out there who's like, well, I'm 50 now, my metabolism's slow. No, it's not. You just don't do enough compared to what you used to do. And if you started doing more, and like we talk about in this daily life experience, yes, work out, of course, have training time, but don't neglect the rest of your life because that's where you're really going to net the biggest long-term push forward in terms of benefit because it's a far greater amount of signals in your daily life than the one hour a day that you exercise for example so when you think of being a kid with skiing yeah you people are like well i could just do it i didn't have to train and work on my mobility and do all these other things right because you were already doing that in your life and we need as adults to incorporate these things into our life and could you be the adult who goes hiking all the time and you never do gym stuff sure but like what if you added a little bit of 
training in the sense of movement training or exercises or end range training or any of the things I teach about or anyone you love who teaches about stuff, what if you also incorporated that as you are someone who hikes around? I think folks would be in a much better place both to be ready to be on the slopes, but also to feel comfortable in their body because they wouldn't feel like, like I say in the book, the doom of 40 has arrived and your sack of aches and pains has shown up and you know, some evil entity has ruined your life now because you're 40 or 45 or 50 or 60. Um, That wouldn't be the case if we just changed how we operated in our existence in a really doable way. Yeah, that's interesting too. And, you know, funny enough, the first thing I thought of as you were talking about that was our, my guest last week, Todd Stewart. Yeah. And I mean, what a great example of a human being who literally has focused his life on having more time. And I mean, I look at him, you know, he's probably in his sixties. I mean, he's a fit guy, but think, you know, I think about how much he's out living on the land, you know, spending time kayaking or skiing or doing these things. And, and, um, that's, that's a really good point. And, and, uh, that's, that is kind of a funny study to hear because I, I literally had that same conversation with somebody two days ago, you know, and it's like, you know, just wait till you're, I think it was, I was talking to a buddy, an old ski buddy of mine and he was, <laughs> he was talking to, talking to his kids, and I think he showed like a high school photo to me, and his kids were like, "Wow, you're uh, you're fat now," you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "No, he's like, no, my metas- my meta- you just wait, your metabolism's mm-hmm. gonna slow down, just wait." And you know, these kids are like 15 years old, so they're yeah. like you know bean poles and and you know they don't understand what these old guys well, are talking about. Well, it's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it, to realize that it wasn't. It wasn't not your fault. You were a contributing factor to whatever has occurred. And you, I say that in the most loving way because I have experienced my own contributing factors of how my life was lived. I mean, you know my story. Like, I was not a healthy individual in my 20s. I had lots of dis-ease. Um, I had challenges with being comfortable in my body, with the weight that I was at, with the body composition that I maintained, with how my body moved, with pain I felt. I had all of these challenges. And along the way I learned, oh, I could participate and change this. So I never say that to say, well, it's your fault that whatever happened, but you can participate in the change of it. Maybe you just didn't know. Maybe you're like, whoa, I didn't know that metabolisms don't slow down. Weird, I guess I should take a look at some other factors. But I think if we choose not to take on those other factors, well, then that's on us. I mean, we're adults now, we know, and we can learn and we can explore. And I teach that in the book, like, if there's something you're dissatisfied with, like go exploring and figure it out. Like you're not going to find the answer just sitting there accepting whatever mainstream narrative you've been told about what aging is like. And I have 20 years of working with clients and with training myself who are proving that the narrative that too old is a thing that can occur. They prove it wrong every day. And I actually have my first two clients who I, I mention in the book were so monumentally important to me because they proved to me what I thought was true, which is always good when your confirmation bias is, you know, supported. But what I thought was true was that it's got to be complete BS that you just fall apart as you age. That's got to be BS. It can't be true, even though up to meeting those people, everybody I saw was proving the narrative correct. When you get older, things fall apart. When you get older, you gain weight. When you get older, you feel like trash, you stop doing things, life shrinks. So that's what I saw. And I was like worried that that was real for me. I was like, I would rather die than have that be real for me. And I just, something in me was like, it can't be true. It can't be true. And I met these people and I had I got, had already had my BS in exercise science, so I had tons of knowledge about how bodies work. And then went on my own self-study to explore more because Most of what I use today to coach is not what I got from my degree. It's way beyond that. But I saw these people and they were, one was just turning 60 and the other was in his late 50s. Um, And in the 10 years that I worked with them weekly, every week we worked together, we'd have a session a week and then they would be doing their workouts on their own. They legit, like they Benjamin Button, like that movie, they reverse aged. They were lighter. They were fitter. They were happier. They had had more experiences. They had they had gone the opposite direction of their peers who were going the direction of kind of what people tend to think old old aging is like. They were going the other direction and having these amazing life experiences. And that was all I needed to say, okay, I knew it. I knew it, that that's not the way it has to go, but you have to be proactive and you have to accept your role and responsibility in that journey 
and that's that's really where all this stuff that I teach today comes from. And I love when people are like, "You just wait," because I'm like, "Dude, I'm 41 now. Like, when? What am I waiting for? Like, I'm a. I know you've been waiting to be this old. So I know that, I so have been. So that. I can say that. And I'm a female who's going to go through menopause and have major hormonal changes. And I know for sure that even that, I'm going to figure it out and make it work. Because like, what's the alternative to just be like, okay, I'm going to roll over and die? No, thank you. Yeah. No. Well, and, and so like, you know, that's really where you start kind of in, in the book is, is starting about the idea of too late, you know? And I think that that's a real common theme throughout the whole book. And, um, <clears throat> that's something that I, I hear being around you and, and your work, you know, on a daily basis is this idea that too old is a myth. And, um, you know, I think really, um, that theme kind of popping up constantly in the book is, I mean, base, there's multiple times where it's sort of like, if you're not dead, it's not too late. Yeah. You know, like there's always an opportunity. And, and I think um, that's, that's a really kind of poignant thing. And I think important for people to realize too, is, is this idea that you always, you can always make change. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that's what, it, what is it interesting getting into your forties. And I, I do, I actually do feel better then I, I think 20, 20s are interesting, right? Like 20s, you're just kind of going a million, or at least I was, you're just going a million miles an hour. You know, it's fueled on just go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't really look back and like, I don't feel like I could compare where I'm at now to my 20s because I'm just like, I don't even know if that even would make sense. But honestly, in my 30s, which is when I felt like a lot of the people around me were starting to say it was too late or I'm just heading towards over the hill. Like thirties were kind of interesting, especially like once you kind of hit like 35 and I, man, I feel way better now than I did in my mid thirties, probably because the twenties led into fueling my life with, you know, like PBR and burritos and, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> you it's know, whatever, it's but setting habits and it's, it's building patterns into your life of how you live that will eventually like, they're always, our bodies are always responding to the signals they receive to every burrito your body is responding okay <laughs> your insulin is flooding your bloodstream like every your body's always responding people right. know this and i use this example in the book with calluses on your hands if you've worked with your hands in any degree whether it's just a weekend of yard work or you are a laborer of some kind or you do manual stuff on the weekends or you rock climb, or you do jujitsu, or anything with your hands, you know that you build calluses on your skin because the skin is receiving low level frequent exposure to some force on it. And in turn, it is growing a thicker callus. If I used to do gymnastics, I did gymnastics until I was 14, and then they told me I was too big and too tall, and so I quit because I, I believed them. And then I got back into it when I was 30, and I had to lie about my age because they were like, no adults. <laughs> um, and so in gymnastics, you do the uneven bars. Well, the women do. Men do P bars um, and a high bar. And you wear grips because you are going to be swinging around on the bars and it rips your hands open. Even with your grips on, your, which are like le leather blockers between you and the bar, basically, um, you still are going to sustain rips sometimes because the force, like the first time I did a giant, which is when you swing all the way around the bar, the force was so great of my body weight and I held the bar a little too hard that I ripped the skin off my hand, off my entire palm, from my, think of your, where you get calluses on your palms, all the way down to my thumb. I ripped all the skin off. And I was like, well, that's gonna hurt to shower for a couple of weeks. Um, but that's because the force was too much for what my skin was tolerant of. But over time, I learned to grip the bar less intensely. I did it more regularly and I developed thick skin in that area instead of the rip that occurred the first time. So that is a perfect example that lots of people can understand about how bodies always respond to signals. Now, apply that to your life when you're in your 20s, your body is responding to these things, but if you're go, 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 whether it's building a family, a business, traveling the world, partying, whatever you're doing in your 20s, you're, I mean, let's all be real. Some of us are tuned in in our 20s, a lot of us are not paying attention to all the things that maybe we should. And so you get into your 30s and you still live that way and you're now going to start seeing the effects that you maybe didn't catch before. They were happening the entire time. You just maybe didn't catch them for whatever reason. So then in your 30s, you're like, oh my God, what is starting to happen here? Because you're actually aware of the responses that were occurring the entire time. And that's where I think a lot of people drop the story off. They're like, well, okay, this is what everybody's always told me aging is. 
here we go. <laughs> Thankfully, I mean, my first word was no when I was born. Shocking, right? Super shocking. Super shocking. Um, <laughs> Thankfully, if I am like the speaker of truth that you need to hear, that's like, no, you don't have to accept that. Good. Because I want everyone listening to go on that mission of like, I don't accept whatever I'm living with. I want it to be better. And I want to do whatever I can to make that better. And what comes with knowing your body's always responding is that you're going to have to try some stuff and you're going to have to be willing to put the work in and accept that sometimes you're going to hit a dead end and be like, well, damn, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. But that's still not the end of the story. Like I say in the book, even a catastrophic injury, which would be terrible, awful and totally unfair, you still have something you can do after that. It's funny that you know me personally, like I'll, I'll, I'll share a little personal here. I don't really do well with things that are unfair when it comes to work. Like I often will be like, why are they such an idiot? Like that's not fair. They're making my life more difficult because they're not doing their job or whatever in my business. Um, and I have to work through that still. But in terms of bodies and health, I fully accept what you've accepted, accepted in life and always remind me of that it's unfair. No one said it would be fair. Everybody's gonna have their cross to bear. It's gonna be different from someone else's. It's gonna suck sometimes. And you're gonna have to like muster up and fight with it or accept it and just, you know, carry the cross forever. Yeah, that's, it, well, and, and and like you're talking about with, with all this stuff is, it, this is kind of the first thing you hit on in the book is the signal response principle. And I I love that how how it's broken down because it seems really obvious but it's i know i i guess i can only speak for myself but it's like I, maybe i don't think about inputs every day like oh if i just change the inputs that's what's like i i am basically the sum of all the signals i'm inputting or or doing every day you know and that it does seem obvious, but I think you do a really good job in the book of sort of like spelling it out. Like these different signals are making your body respond in, in different ways. And, and, and then that kind of leads into this, this concept of, of, and you mentioned this is there might be dead ends. There might be things that you do. And you talk about the, what you call the explorer's mindset and sort of this idea of experimentation of different signals. You know, what are you doing every day? You know, and I, I think that's, it, it seemed, like I said, what's cool is it seems really to someone like me, it, 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 it was, it's really easy to understand what you're saying in the book, but because I think we, we have a, a natural way of thinking that most people do, but I don't know, like, I don't know if people just give up on inputting differently or experimenting with their body. I think like, we're busy. Well, yeah, it's like, we kind of talked about that. It's like, it's almost like, I don't know, like as a young person, you just believe life's great, right? Maybe kind of going back to the age thing in, in that way, you know, and I always say kind of tying this into my own personal philosophy, I'm always telling young people like, you know, there's, there's kind of three stages of a dreamer, you know, like when we're all 19 years old, everyone's experimenting with everything. You're young. You believe the world is your oyster. You're going to do all these great things and you're just a go, go, go. And I always say 25 is the first cutoff where people start kind of peeling away from that. And it, it's distinct. You have societal pressures, life's changing. Maybe you got a, you know, quote unquote, real job. You know, you got out of college, whatever. I guess you got out of college as a skier if you're 25, because <laughs> that means you didn't graduate in a timely manner. But, um, and uh, yeah, I think as you maybe your perception of having time dwindles, you stop changing the signals. You start, you stop exploring. Well, inertia you know? is a real pain in the butt. Yeah. It's a huge problem because it makes it easier and easier the longer you do it. And so the longer you aren't active, the harder it is to become active. The longer you're too busy to take care of that weird ache in your hip you've been dealing with forever, the harder it becomes to start. Like in any habit change book that you could read, that is the first thing highlighted that starting is the hardest part and the hardest part to make it through because like everybody can talk a big game. Yeah, I wanna change. Yeah, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds this year. Yeah, I'm gonna ski whatever many days this year. But then you actually have to, to do it. 
And you have to like get over your old habits that were easier because they are habits and do things that are harder for a period of time. Now, the first three weeks of any habit change, once you get over the hump, are then the easiest because everything's novel and everything is new and you have momentum and excitement. After 21 days, your brain's like, oh, this again, oh God. And that's when the real habit formation begins. And so that's why like when I take people through training, I'm saying the minimum you should commit to anything is 30 days. When it comes to fitness, I would say 60 days because you need physiological change to occur in the tissues and in the joints and in the muscles. That takes longer than two weeks. Um, But you also need the habit to become a habit. You need it to become more automatic. And you've been through this. I mean, I've watched you go through this in our life, like things that I would do every day, you would kind of a first look on and be like, that's interesting, what is she doing? (laughs) And then you might ask some questions about it and then you would just work it into your life sorta and sometimes more or less. Sorta, I like that. Sorta, kinda. (laughs) But there's things you do now that I'm like, I remember when you didn't have the time to do that and now you do it every day. So what changed? You somehow found the time, which then the third part of habit formation is, if your life's already full and busy and full of inertia, because this is the way you've always lived, um, you're going to have to reorganize your life and remove some things because if it's already full, you can't add more. To add more, like a fitness practice, like dealing with your hip, like hiring a coach and you're gonna meet him every week for a training session, whatever your goal is, you have to remove something else. And the real pithy stuff that people say is like, yeah, stop watching Netflix at night or get off your phone and like, Yes, for a variety of health reasons, maybe limit those things, but it's much bigger than that. I think you need to remove some things within yourself about how you view yourself and your day that then will open up the time for you to have the time to do the thing you want. Because like, let's be real, at the end of a long day, sometimes you want to watch a Netflix show. We do. Sometimes we read books. Sometimes we go on our phone. Like you still need to rest and relax at the end of a day. And for someone starting a new habit, that may not be the best time to put a workout in because like how restful is that? Not so much. So when we're thinking about starting up something and saying, okay, I believe what she says. I want to get younger instead of get older, even though I'm 40 now or 50 or 60. Um, Look at your life and find the ways that you can remove inertia, make room for things. And yeah, maybe structurally in your day structure it different, but also look within and like, what do I need to remove within to make it so I have the, that I, like you, you are now a person who does certain habits every day that you didn't do before. And I think you can only do that through an explorer's mindset. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I 100% agree. I mean, it, I mean, maybe that, maybe that really hits the nail on, I, I think it does hit the nail on the head. I mean, people slow down to the point where it's hard to start again and again to me it just seems obvious like when we look around and talk to friends and people that are having um uh maybe health issues or one of the things i thought of is you were talking about that because i think of starting a new habit or something and you know the classic thing in our house is you know i'll have uh like i'll have some foot pain (laughs) you know and and i you know, classic me, I'll be like, my foot hurts, you know? And I've been saying it for, uh, you know, like I've got this, yeah, exactly. I've been saying, <laughs> was that, was that the look at the, I was looking at my look watch. at the watch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean like, you know, it, it could be like months where I've just got some weird funky little joint pain. And, you know, I, it, and I told you this as I read as I, as I read the book. I'm kind of laughing to myself because I'm like literally living this, uh, you know, the, this methodology that I'm now reading about. And I'm like, oh, this makes so much more sense. I just need to change the signals in my in my life. Like, and that's what you'd always say. I'd be like, my foot hurts, and you're like, well, what are you doing about it? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. What am I doing about it? <laughs> and you you kind of be like, doesn't look like you're really doing anything about it. <laughs> You know, so I, I think, um, you know, when I think about that with skiing, especially cause you know, you go out, you get banged up a little bit, something's going to hurt. And then, uh, you know, I think I would just sit with it. Yeah. Like, Oh, I tweaked, I tweaked this or I did this or, um, 
but I, for, for whatever reason, I, I, I don't think I ever was explore. I wasn't using the explorer's mindset to then solve the problem. And I think that's kind of what you get into. And I think the book really helps out. And, and, and the other thing I like is you sort of have this, uh, journaling aspect to it, which I do. I do like that. I, I like to write. And I think that does help people like me sort of pen to paper helps me sort of unravel maybe what's going on. Yeah. And, and so kind of applying it to, you know, maybe a, a little ski tweak or something that happens on the mountain. I think honestly, if I, I think, um, maybe journaling about it or writing down like, Hey, I'm going to try this to see if this improves yeah. the the pain or something like that. I think that really, really helps as well. Well, it's too. so important. I mean, the studies are clear that kids, when they're taking notes in school, retain more knowledge when they write it down on paper, not type it on their computer, not store it on their phone, not take a picture of the notes on the black. Well, we don't have blackboards anymore, but which still <laughs> you bothers me. You just totally me. aged yourself. I love blackboards. <laughs> Clap the erasers when you're done. It's great. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> clapping erasers. I, that's taking it back. <laughs> oh, the joys of childhood in the 80s. Young people are like, I'm definitely stopping this podcast right now. <laughs> what are you guys talking Just about? Just come back in 30 years when you're old, okay? And we'll have some solutions for you. Sorry, um, people. We're still kind of analog over here. <laughs> it's great. I love it. Um, the, like, I lost my train of thought because I was laughing about that so hard. Oh, yeah, writing. Um, it's, it's clear that you retain more when you write it down and, and, and pen on paper. Um, so that's part of it, that you're going to retain more of your experience of exploring around. And we keep talking about the explorer's mindset. I go into it in great detail in the book. So somebody can read the book if you want to learn the whole process. But um, you have a busy life too. So in addition to retaining more of like having the slight tweak on the hill that you're like, oh, I want to do something about my knee or whatever. I just banged up on the hill. Um, in addition to helping you remember that 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 happened and the experience of it and wanting to work on that, you're extraordinarily busy. We all are. Even if you're making room in your life to be fit and healthy and strong and whatever, um, you still have a lot of demands on your day and on your attention. And so like who could possibly keep track of everything in their mind? Like our goal is not to be those servers who can memorize your order. And that always terrifies me when there's 10 people at the table. Cause I'm like, how are you doing this? Um, <laughs> That's not the goal. The goal is to get answers about our body. And the only way you're going to get answers is by actually using, like I teach in the book, like of, of the scientific method, like figure out what the problem is. What do you think will solve it? Do an experiment and actually look into it and take action on it and then track your results. In addition, you might face this again in the future. Wouldn't it be nice to have a written something that you could go back to and be like, oh yeah, I did this, this, and this last time. I'm gonna do that first this time because it solved the problem last time. I'll do it the first time this time. And maybe it doesn't solve the problem this time. Wow, isn't that interesting? Because now, not only, you're not like, oh man, see, bad luck's here. It doesn't work for me anymore. You go, oh, interesting. There's more to the story this time around. I get to learn some new things and see what else I can figure out. So the value of writing something down is like threefold in my opinion. And I, I think everyone should do it. It's why I made a journal that you can buy to go with the book because it's this um, guided field journal of sorts, which I, I love field journals when like archaeologists would go out or geologists and they'd write about what they saw. I just thought those were the neatest journals in the world because you're writing what you see and you're writing what you experience, experience and then you're writing what you're learning as you're maybe working with the rocks that you're finding or digging up a fossil or whatever people used to do when they'd go out in the field. Um, that's why I made a field journal for folks. And it's got all these guided pages to help you do this and put it into practice because all of this is nice, but if you don't do something with it, it's kind of for naught, you know? Yeah, no, that's that's a... It's a great way to be able to look back and, you know, I, I think it's, it's a lot like history, you know, like if you don't, if you don't have your own personal history written down, you're doomed to repeat it. <laughs> right. Which is like classic, you know, like classic me, I guess. Like I think about when I, when I don't document what's going on, you know, or I have those aches and pains from skiing or something like that, I tend to just sort of go, mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to keep plowing through it. I don't, I don't actually look at the notes and change the signals. And I think that's, that is where, um, I've started doing that more. I wouldn't say I'm a pro at this by any means, but learning and identifying that I think is actually 
um, it's, it's making me healthier and help helping me, um, be a better athlete, you know, at my age. And I, and I've been thinking about this as we talk, cause it's so interesting. The word fitness, when you put it with skiing to me is so interesting because then I hear what we're talking about. And I think what, what fascinates me about it, cause when people hear ski fitness, they do, they think like a workout program. Mm-hmm. And I feel like what we're talking about, I actually, I, I do think there are specific things that you can train and you can, you know, there are fitness programs, obviously, mm-hmm. to make you better, like the group you did and mm-hmm. whatnot. But I also think some of the stuff we're talking about is also incredibly important in terms of um, just accomplishing more day-to-day tasks and being a good uh well, good human being, a healthy human being, but also being able to go out and do some skiing. Yeah, think of it like this. Like if we have a big circle and inside of the circle is everything you need to do to be a healthy, happy human being who can go skiing whenever they want, one small circle within that big circle is a workout. It's there and it's important, but it's one. If we look at the entire week of your life of this past week, your workout was, let's say we work out an hour and we do it three times a week. That's three hours out of 160 something that are in your week. So like, where is the bulk of your time? It's in how you live your life. And that's what I hope people get out of the book and with my my methods is that it's not just a method in that I say you should do ABC. It's a way to think. It's a way to view your world. It's a way to work with your world and with whatever you have to make it work for you so that you can fill in the rest of that circle that makes you a healthy, happy human being that of, of which working out is one small part of the bigger picture. Yeah, no, I love that. It's, it, it's an ecosystem. I mean, there's all these different things going on. Um, one of the things I want to, I want to get into and and we kind of, we've kind of touched on it, but a part of the book that I, I find really fascinating and I, I feel like is very applicable to, uh, ski culture is pain mm. because, and and I want you, I want to talk a little bit about this because again, I think this is just like a day to day thing. Like people are like, I, you know, I have aches and pains. It just seems like it's a, it becomes a more common topic, but I don't know if the way that you talk about it in the book, I think has really kind of opened my mind to what, what it is. And, you know, I, especially in telemark skiing, hundred percent, this is like a common topic because people are always, they, they get to a point where they're like, my knees hurt or, or the people that get out of telemarking maybe, which is interesting again, as again, as I'm getting into my forties and I've been telemark skiing for a really long time, like almost 30 years, which is bizarre to say, but, um, I'm feeling, I'm not feeling what these people are saying. So I'm kind of confused maybe where that's coming not you know if you if they had some catastrophic injury i mean that's one thing but um t- can can you kind of guide guide me through a yeah. little bit of like what pain is and where does it come from and and how to approach that w- it within this these concepts that, that yeah. you have in the book i think introducing it is important and i i do hope folks will read the book and because the pain chapter is one of my favorite chapters in the book it was one of my favorite to write and i think it came out as one of the best chapters of the book too um generally speaking society has a bizarre and twisted relationship with pain it's been chopped up six ways from sunday so that it doesn't even mean the same thing to different people It doesn't get looked at or viewed in the same lens, depending on who you're talking to. And it's been kind of bastardized with like what it consists of. As a coach for 20 years now, I've met thousands of people, tens of thousands of people at this point who I've had conversations with about their body, most of which include, I have some kind of pain. Um, And whether it's a low level thing or they're in chronic pain or they have an old injury they're healing, everyone I've talked to has had some kind of pain that they're trying to work on. And people have been told a gamut of things. One, ignore it. Okay, that's a terrible idea. I'll tell you why in a second. Two, um, it's all in your head. Wow, super not helpful because now the per- you're making the person feel crazy. Also not useful when it comes to solving pain. Um, people have been told that there's a uh, 
identifiable cause of their pain and it's on their MRI report. Also not helpful. So let's get into a few of these here. And it, it, there's like a million. I could do an hour just on pain. I really could. Um, in the old days, pain was viewed as something that has a source that is biomedical in nature, meaning there's something wrong with your body. Something's going on in your body. That's why you have pain. Your um, blood is infected and you've gone septic. You have pain. Your bone is broken. Hence, you have pain. Um, you have an organ that is failing or hormones that are messed up and you have pain. And that might be true in some instances, but what we know now is that there are many factors related to pain and the experience of it, which have nothing to do with your physical body or your wellness. You can experience pain and have zero physiological anythings, broken, torn, strained, irritated, whatever, inflamed, you can have nothing wrong with your body and still feel pain. You can also have extraordinarily difficult things going on in your body and feel no pain. Some of the other factors, what we now call, instead of the biomedical model of pain, we call it the biopsychosocial model of pain. You don't have to remember that. It just means that there's more points to pain than, than just your body. So for instance, um, your beliefs will contribute to whether or not you experience pain. Past experiences you've had will contribute to whether or not you experience pain and how severe it is. Um, memories, uh, things other people have told you, your status of your socioeconomic environment, your home relations. These are all things that will influence whether or not you experience pain and how severe you feel it. On top of that, you might also have physical stuff going on. The problem is that people still approach pain as one, something to get rid of or ignore, and two, that it always has a connection to the physical body that you should be able to find and identify. And unfortunately, that leaves a lot of people in the dark because there's a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm not kidding when I tell you, of the tens of thousands of people I've worked with over 20 years, many several thousand have had MRI reports and x-rays that a doctor told them is this is why you have pain, but everything we do for that part of the body isn't getting rid of their pain. And everything we do for the rest of their body isn't getting rid of the pain. And it's only when we start to broaden and say, hey, this might not actually be what's contributing to why you feel pain, um, that we start to explore into the rest of our life and see what other things might be going on. Now, this isn't to poo-poo the fact that there may be something going on with our body. Of course, I will always remind people of that. Um, but it's too narrow of a scope when we think of pain to just look at the body and just look at the tissues. One of the quotes I use in the book talks about seeing pain as a constellation of unpleasant experiences, sensations, and situations with our body that can form into something that we identify as a painful sensation in our body. And I know now, as I'm saying this, there's gonna be a lot of folks out there who are like, this is too woo for me. <laughs> and I'm like, this ain't woo, this is how it works. Like, this is how it works. And I'll use myself as an example. I um, tore my ACL in 2016 climbing and um, rehabbed that whole thing, no surgery or anything like that, but um, had gone months without pain at that point. And had an incredibly stressful business situation happen. Didn't do anything different in my life. With normal workouts, normal walk, everything was the same other than that. And I woke up the next morning with really uncomfortable pain in my knee that got worse as the day went on. Using my explorer's mindset, I navigated through all this stuff and looked through the knowledge I have about pain science. I've read lots of research about pain, so I understand it and can try to at least wrap my hands around it a bit to work with my clients who are experiencing pain. Um, and I was able to come to the conclusion that I bet this has something to do with the fact that my stress just increased exponentially and I wasn't handling that stress very well. I wasn't coping with it very well. It was a bit overwhelming. And that that likely has something to do with what's going on here. Now, the benefit of knowing that is that instead of doing what a lot of people do, which is, oh no, the pain is back. I better stop everything I'm doing. Shrink their circle of what they're doing in their daily life. Oh no, the pain is back. I better rub it really hard and do a bunch of stuff to it which may not have been necessary in the first place and could actually exacerbate it. That's what a lot of people tend to do. 
So instead, knowing like this is probably related to my thing I just went through, let me just watch it. Let me keep doing what I'm doing and let me tend to the stress. Let me actually divert my attention here. So maybe instead of Netflix tonight, I'm gonna do some of my breathing exercises. I'm gonna meditate. I'm gonna write in my journal and get all my frustrations out. And it's like, see where I can get with this. Sure enough, in the span of a few days, my knee felt fine again. And I was back to where I had been prior to this thing happening. That's just one example and a simple one compared to a lot of the more complex cases that I've come across with clients. But pain shouldn't be ignored because it's a signal from your brain telling you something needs to be paid attention to. But what needs to be paid attention to may not just be the knee where the pain is. It may be some other stuff that's going on that is contributing to how you experience your body and in this case, a painful sensation. So we should never ignore it. It's always telling us something's going on. But it's also not telling us clearly that your knee is busted if you have knee pain. It's not telling us that at all. And like um, I I share some uh, studies in the book about how many times they've done research and studies to look at MRI imagings of various groups and how many had what you would call a problematic MRI, had meniscal damage, had strain or stress or tears or whatever in their knee ligaments, had labrum tears in their shoulder and had zero symptoms. Didn't even know, wouldn't have known until they had the imaging done. And this quote from Dr. Um, Howard Lux, who's a orthopedic surgeon who I enjoy quite a bit with his writing, um, his famous quote is, you can't unsee your MRI report. So when you're thinking about pain, be very mindful about the stories you're being told about your pain. Someone telling you, you're stuck this way now. Good luck. Enjoy the next 10 years of your life. Your knee's going to give out on you. Um, Be very mindful of who you listen to about what they experienced with their similar sounding injury, because that may not be what it's going to be like for you. But if you adopt that as your story, you're more likely to make that your story. Be very careful about imaging as well and do it when it's absolutely necessary, but don't be so beholden to it that it's the only thing you consider about how your body is operating. And then take a look at your experience of pain and really try to figure out what's going on for you beyond just what we've all taught, been taught when we were young, which was like, oh, ice it. Oh, just wrap it up. Oh, put a brace on it. You're just stuck with that now. Um, There's way more to it than that. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that the the way of looking at that, I think gives a lot more hope to, to the way that I think about it now in terms of solutions or how to listen to pain, you know, in, in a positive way and that it's actually trying to tell you something and, you know, you might need to make some changes and analyze it a little bit better. So, um, there's so much good stuff in this book and, and I think, uh, you know, it, 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 it talks about so many things that I think are useful just for everybody, not obviously just telemark series i just be fortunate <laughs> enough to have you here to 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 do a podcast and 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 i think that it's uh, a real some really important things that people can learn um i guess just kind of as we wrap up like <clears throat> for those that uh i i highly recommend everybody read this book first off it's awesome i just finished it and i like i said i think it's just it this it's not a it's not a ski book it's not a telemark book but it's a it's a uh, a good life book and, and health book that I think is going to be really beneficial to your telemark skiing or whatever else you're doing in your life. But I'm Kate, I'm kind of curious, like from, from your perspective as a new telemark skier, you know, do you, maybe, uh, is there anything else that you touch on in the book that you feel like would be, uh, maybe interesting to call out, you know, for, for people that are listening to the podcast that are most likely, tuned in because they're telemark skiers i would think you know yeah i think the chapter on how injuries happen and how tissues change are also incredibly important for anyone who wants to build their body and and I, the, the way i thought of my book is this is a book for humans so if you're one of those this book will be helpful to you um but the the two chapters i gave on how injuries happen and how tissues change really give you the equation you need because I am not a fan of teaching you, how, what's that? Teach a man to fish versus give a man a fish quote, right from the Bible or something like that. Um, 
I'm not a fan of giving fish. I'm here to help. I will help shorten the path for you so that it's as efficient as possible because I know so much. I know how to clear the path away for you, but I still am going to expect that you learn what you need to learn because I'm not doing my job. If you walk away from, for example, reading my book or working with me in a program, if you come away not being more capable of handling yourself in these situations, I didn't do my job. So we started with highlighting first when I was putting this book together, like we got to understand why injuries happen and we got to understand why tissues change. Because if you understand those two things, you understand the whole thing and you can apply it to anything. Because once you understand the very obvious reason why injuries occur from little subtle aches to big injuries, like tearing your ACL or something like that, um, you then know not only how to resist more injuries in the future, you know how to make yourself more resilient to bounce back from them faster if they occur. You know what to do to make it so that you can avoid those when possible and when not possible and they're going to occur. Like if you got in a car accident that wasn't your fault, you know you now know what to do because you know how it occurred and thus you reverse the equation and you build it back up. And then learning how tissues change gives you the other side of the equation. If you go, oh, that's how a tissue changes the more I change my tissues to be more resistant to an injury, now I see how those two work together. And by knowing how a tissue changes, you can then look at your entire training program and say, am I changing my tissues in the way I want to or am I missing anything here? Do I need to circle back around and maybe fill in with something beyond what I'm already doing? Because you could also apply everything I teach in the book to any training program you want to do, not just mine. Um, and that's important because there's lots of great ways to train your body out there. And yeah, some are probably more sound than others, but there's also a value of like, I, you like doing it, so do it. But also evaluate if it's giving you everything you need, because what a bummer if like you could have made a few extra additions to the training program you like, and that would have made you more resilient, but you didn't do that because you didn't know. And so I think for telemark skiers, especially who are thinking about feeling good in their body, being able to ski for a long period of time, you do need to know how injuries occur and how tissues change. And when you read those two things, you'll go, okay, I've got the pieces of the puzzle to put into practice. And for those who are like, well, I still want to learn more. I do have further resources. There'll be a brand new program coming with the book. There's coaching you can do. There's, there's my blog and all sorts of things I write. There's more you can learn. But my goal is to give you the foundation so that that is set. And then we can build on that wherever we want to take it from there. Yeah, no, I love that. Well, where where can people pick up the book? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can visit my website, theunbreakablebody.com, and you'll see everything you need to see to buy the book there. If you prefer Amazon, or if you're outside of the lower 48 of the US, please order through Amazon because I'm not shipping beyond the lower 48 at this time. Um, and you'll be able to get it kind of anywhere in the world thanks to the channels that Amazon has. Um, you can also get it on Kindle if you're an e-reader. People ask about an audio book. That's probably down the road a little bit because it's a lot of work, but I would really love for people to pick up a copy of the book. You can also get the journal um, both at my website and at Amazon um, as well. So if you like what you're hearing, you're going to love the book because it's pretty cool in terms of a manual for how to actually buck the myth that it could possibly be too late or too complicated for you to figure this out. And I say that confidently as the author of this book, it does that for you. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll second the motion. And, and I can say as someone who just finished reading it and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I'm very proud that you put this book out. Thank you. And, 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 and it's amazing. And I've seen you put all the hard work into it. So I'm sure I have some bias, but um, as someone who's read it and, and, and like I said, you know, someone who's around living this on a daily basis and kind of didn't, you're really sneaky about <laughs> changing, changing the way that uh, maybe I look and, and do things. And, uh, but not sneaky in, in a bad way by any means. It, I just, it's just curate your environment so that you happen to yeah, want to choose things I, I think that, that are more favorable that's a, for you. That's a fantastic way to put it. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, top to bottom physically, like I, I feel so much better. And, and then reading this has really been able to break it down in terms of, you know, the written word of, of, of maybe why that's happening. And uh, I've really enjoyed that. So I hope people will pick the book up. I think it's amazing. And uh, I'll make sure to put um, 
links in the show notes to all the stuff you just referenced, how to get to the website, um, and obviously how to get additional resources and potentially do some training. So I love that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on and I appreciate the support for the labor of love. Like it is not easy to stick by someone as they write a book and slave away, but it reminds me a lot of learning to telemark ski because there's no shortcut unless you want to pay someone to ski for you. Like I could pay <laughs> someone to write the book for me, but I'm not doing S- that. Surrogate telemark skier. <laughs> yeah, it's, it reminds me a lot of that and the, the trials and tribulations and hiccups and headaches. And, and you, and like you always say, it's, it's a personality choice, yeah. right? Like you have to be willing to suck for a very long time <laughs> to be a telemark skier. And the same is true if you want to be an author. Yeah, no, I know. And, and, uh, I, 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 I'm glad I'm glad to have you on again and talk about this. And I know um, it's been cool to see your body of work and mine kind of meld together and start seeing some of the crossover people yeah. that have reached out and done some training with you and stuff. And I just think it's it's fantastic. And um, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll have a chance to talk to some of them even. Maybe that'd be fun to have on the that'd podcast at some, sometime. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank and, you. Uh, Good luck with the book and congratulations. Thanks again. So glad I could have Kate on the podcast again and uh, always fun to talk and (laughs) I get to talk to her every day. Come on. Um, (laughs) But it's nice to talk and have her expertise uh, in her field. And like I was saying, I love that we've been able to sort of mix uh, sort of what she does and have her on the podcast and also have seen people from the telemark world come over and train with her and learn from her. And obviously I, like I said in the podcast multiple times, I've been able to learn so much, uh, just health and fitness, things that are making me feel better here in my forties. And it's just great. And now that now having read her book, you know, it just, for me, just put it even more into perspective and kind of gave me a way to break it down. I'm kind of, sometimes I'm not, not the sharpest tool in this, in the shed. So (laughs) I need something in front of me that kind of helps me through the process, but definitely uh, pick up her book and link in the show notes for that just to get you to it easier. And it's a, it's a fantastic read. It's got a, some great tips about how to uh, pursue health and fitness and kind of that methodology of uh, becoming unbreakable. And I think it works great. I know it works great for for telemark skiing because I'm doing it. So I hope you'll check it out too. And I appreciate you listening to the episode. So as always, sign up for the mailing list. This is a great way to stay in touch with us. You know, like this week when we got... Uh, new shipment of 22 bindings in and t- they haven't been in for a while. That's a great way because we're going to fire it out to the mailing list uh, before anything else because that's a great way to connect with all of you that are part of the Free Hill Life family. So link in the show notes for that. You can be on that and get our updates on the weekly about what's going on. As always, how you can support us, support the podcast and all of the other media and crazy projects that we're always doing shop at freehealthlife.com. We want to be your preferred telemark shop. We want to be your source of information and be the place where you can get your questions answered and get the best telemark gear on the planet. And you can go to freehealthlife.com or you can hit up the team directly at customer service at freehealthlife.com. Also telemarksgear.com articles, gear, reviews, more, You can subscribe for the premium content. You can get free news. It's all part of the same family. And we're all free heel lifers. Telemark Skier Magazine at telemarkskier.com. You can email me directly at podcast at freeheellife.com. That's a direct link to my inbox so I know what's going on. If you got events, you got news tidbits or whatnot. And overall, I just appreciate you listening. Thanks for being here every Monday morning. I'll be back next week with uh, plenty of more telemark information <laughs> and the like. But I'm having a blast and really appreciate you sticking with me 
uh, after over 100 episodes, and we're just going to keep on going. So thank you, friends, and Telemark family out there. And until next week, spread Telemark always. See you later.